We're talking about the power of the king to make all kinds of trouble or to do good stuff. But he has the power to declare war. So we're in Mishnah Torah, Helchot Malachim, Umilchamot. We're in Mishnah Torah, the code of Jewish law that was codified by Rambam from the Hamash and the uh, Gemara and the Mishnah and everything. And um, the laws of kings and laws of wars. And one of the examples that we were going through, and we're going to go into to give you that power of the king to make war. He, we already learned that like in the Fifth Amendment, in the American Constitution, the takings clause, the king can take whatever he wants. And the king can um, declare eminent domain. And he may take all the fields, any olive, zayat is olive, any kind of... Uh, olive orchard, orchards, and uh, vineyards. Harem is a vineyard, La Avadav, on behalf of his servants, not only for himself, but also for his servants. So that here's an owner of a really wonderful piece of land, and the king takes it, and it's not even for the king's own use. The king is just going to give it to somebody else who's working for the king. So that is the going to battle. The king has to feed his soldiers. And if he needs to take those olives and those grapes and those fields to feed his men, so he does. And this is where it's like the American Fifth Amendment takings clause. He's supposed to pay for it. It's not supposed to be a pure taking. There is supposed to be some kind of just compensation. And this is part of what Shmuel, we just went over two weeks ago, what Shmuel warned everybody in 1 Samuel chapter 8, Parakhet, Betstochem, Betstochem, Betkarmechem, Betstochem, Atovim, Yikach Venatan Laagadav. That's what Shmuel was warning the people if this is what you want, you better be careful because that's what you're going to get. Okay. And then on top of that, number nine, and you'll see where this ties in with that. Halakha Tet, law nine, in chapter four of the laws of kings and war, call Haragea Melech Mamonam Lamelech. Anybody whom the king has executed, all his property goes to the king. You perhaps have seen this in some of the, um, oh, Middle Ages, move, the movies out of the Middle Ages in Europe, like England or things like that. There are even references in The Godfather, where if, uh, if a Roman emperor would have somebody executed on grounds of treason, all the family estates of the guy that was being executed would belong to the Roman emperor. And what they would often do, and this comes up like in The Godfather with, uh, is it Johnny Five Fingers or something like that? Or uh, Quintangelo, 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 Quintangelo uh, Johnny Quintangelo, where he's basically told, we found out that you've been working against the Corleone family. And you remember what it was like in the old days of Rome, Johnny, that... Uh, when the, when the emperor found out someone was working against him, if the emperor cared enough for the guy, the emperor would give him a choice, would say, I'll give you a few hours to kill yourself, in which case all your family property stays with your family. And if you don't kill yourself in a few hours, I'll have you executed for treason, and then all your stuff basically sheets back to the government. And so they would leave the guy with a knife and a bathtub. And that's what they did in The Godfather. And that's what they did in Spartacus with the Charles Lachlan character. And, uh, and that's what they did in England. And people would kill themselves in order that the king would not get their property. It was understood there was no choice. Of course, they're going to be dead either way. The king's giving them a way out, at least to preserve the estate. Well, it turns out, the Torah provided for the king of Israel the right, if he had an honest-to-goodness traitor, to execute the traitor and take all the traitor's estates 
and very often the traders were very wealthy because like a, reg a regular guy doesn't always there are assassins who start from the bottom of the social rung but a lot of assassins are pretty high up and they kind of get the idea that i don't know i think i ought to be the king and that's how they get themselves in trouble like that guy Prigozhin who was in charge of that charge of that uh, that private army that uh, challenged Putin. And he got it into his head that, you know, why can't I be Putin? And I don't know if he lived long enough to realize on the way down the difference between him and Putin. Um, but that's what happens. A lot of these very big guys, they forget that who they're up against. So the Torah gave the king the authority to execute and to take the person's uh, property. So let's get to that, understanding the power of the king. Let's get that out of the way. And we continue. So he could take their property, and it would go, just as the king gets all property of people he has executed. Likewise, if he wins battles, everything he takes from the treasuries of the defeated nations go to him as well. Now, what's taken from other nations' royal treasuries go to the king. What's taken from the nation's remaining treasuries besides those that belong to their kings, that gets divided partly to the king of Israel and partly to everybody else. Okay. Let's take a look at first kings, Malachim Aleph. Many of us have heard of Ahab. King Ahab and his wife, Ezebel, uh, Queen Jezebel. In many ways, King Ahab is regarded as the most evil king, or one of the two or three most evil kings in Jewish history. Uh, there's a list. There's uh, Yeravam, Jeroboam, who the first king of the northern, he's the one who started the civil war and was the first leader of the northern kingdom when the country divided in half. And uh, so he's regarded as particularly evil. Uh, there was King Menashe of the southern kingdom who ruled 55 years with great evil and promoted much bloodshed and is regarded perhaps as the most evil of all the kings in the south. And then you had King Ahab, and just the name Jezebel. And Ahab, it just, uh, it brings, I don't want to say shudders at this point, it did in their time. Now, you will recall from last, um, from last Thursday, and this is very contextually important why I did it last Thursday, we talked about the difference in character personality and modesty between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. We learned that by and large, the kings of the house of David, the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah, Yehuda, they tended to be more humble, more religious, more deferential to God's prophets. By contrast, the kings of the north, Israel, Samaria, tended to be more arrogant and more difficult. And we learned actually the Gemara last week in Sanhedrin about King Yanai when he was brought to the Sanhedrin, when his servant was accused of committing a killing or a murder. And the chief judge of the Sanhedrin told King Yanai to stand as a witness. And the king said, you want me to stand? When all 71 of you tell me to stand, I'll stand. I'm not standing for one guy alone. And then the head of the Sanhedrin looked to his right. You remember, looked at those 35. Okay, everybody with me? And everybody looked in the ground. He looked in his left. Everybody looked in the ground. Nobody wanted to look at King Yana and say, stand. So Yana remained seated. And they never again called the king of Israel of the northern kingdom to appear before a court because they had too much fear of the king. There could not be justice done with a king like that. So we come back now to see what it was about those kings long before Yanai, who was Talmudic times, in biblical times, one of their first kings was actually uh, King Ahav. And let's remember King Ahav here. Let's go. So 
King Ahav. Things happened. Um, we're not going to take out the time for what happened in the previous chapter. Kerem, a vineyard. Hayalin avoda Yisraeli asher Israel. Happens to be, I was referring just last week and Tuesday to the Valley of Jezreel. Sounds like Israel. Israel with a Zion, Israel with a Sin. But although the two words sound so very similar, they're very, very different. Israel was the alternative name of Yaakov, our third patriarch. So we all co are called the children of Israel, namely the children of Yaakov, B'nai Yisrael. Why aren't we all called the children of Avraham? Because the children of Avraham also included Yishmael and the Arabs. Why aren't we all called the children of Yitzchak? Because the children of Yitzchak included Esav whom our tradition teaches was the progenitor of Europe, the Europeans, and the Christians. But Yaakov, alone among our three patriarchs, only had, quote-unquote, Jewish children. All of his children were the 12 tribes, plus his daughter Dina. So he's the only one of the patriarchs, all of whose kids came out Jewish, shall we say. It's a, it's a partial consolation to the modern-day American Jewish household. If you're a little disappointed the way the kids came out, at least you didn't have Esav or Yishmael. Actually, Yishmael came out pretty good at the end. We're told by the rabbis he came out at the end he was at Sadiq. By contrast, most American Jewish leaders can't say that about their kids, nor can the kids say it about their parents. In fact, they even point out that what's the difference between the average American Jewish leader and Donald Trump? Donald Trump has religious grandchildren who keep Shabbos and kosher, um, unlike American Jewish leaders. So you got that issue. So uh, Yisrael refers to Israel. Jezreel actually is from the word zera. Zera means seed, S-E-E-D. Lizroa is to plant seeds. Yisrael means may God plant. And Emek Yisrael, the Valley of Jezreel is fertile and rich with olives, and God planted this gorgeous valley in the land of Yisrael. So that's Emek Yisrael. Okay, here we go. So getting to Emek Yisrael. Let's get to Emek Yisrael. So let's look at the map and see where this is taking place. You'll remember... I've been telling you that there was going to be, after the time of David and after Solomon, there will be that civil war that will divide us into two countries. The southern country is Benjamin, Yehuda, and it's known as the Kingdom of Judea, or the Southern Kingdom, with its capital, Jerusalem. And the Northern Kingdom will also be known as the Kingdom of Israel, with its capital, Samaria, or Shomron. Okay. And the southern kingdom is Benjamin and Judah. And there's a little patch of Shimon, which is a whole story we're not going to get into now. But other than the outlier circumstances of how Shimon ended up patched in in the middle of Yehuda, other than that, it's basically very neatly, the southern kingdom is essentially Benjamin and Yehuda and the tribe of Levi, who are based in Yerushalayim at the Beit HaMikdash. And all the other ten tribes are in the northern kingdom. And as I pointed out, it really comes to 13 tribes, not 12. Because Yosef gets split in half, so to speak. Menashe, there's West Menashe, west of Jordan, and East Menashe, east of Jordan, and Ephraim. Okay. Now, if you can see on this map, in this northern kingdom of 10 tribes, just north of Ephraim and Manasseh is the city of Jezreel, Israel, and there's Megiddo. And this line from Mount Carmel, and the line that separates yellow to green, yellow to purple, yellow to, to rust orange, 
This line is the Valley of Jezreel. Emek Yisrael, it's a long valley. And it runs all the way from the Mediterranean Sea, basically, at Mount Carmel, all the way down Megiddo, some call it the Valley of Megiddo, and it's best known as the Emek Yisrael. Another map giving you that sense of the kingdom of Yehuda, the southern kingdom of Judah, which is Benjamin and Yehuda, and then the 10 tribes that comprise all this yellow or tan is the country of Israel, the northern kingdom of Samaria with capital Shomron. There's your capital city, Samaria. And Emek Jezreel, well, there's, there's Megiddo. And this little promontory here is Mount Carmel. And we saw it runs, it's a nice long run. It's a nice long run. And to give you one more shot at it, really nice, really nice map of Jezreel. Here's the north. By now you've got a good sense of it. You remember Mount Gilboa. That was the battle of King Saul. Uh, that was the battle of King Saul, where uh, at the end of First Samuel. And that was Mount Gilboa. The Philistines had come all the way up there. And then you have from Mount Carmel at the promontory, all the way, the Valley of Jezreel to the Jordan River. A humongous amount of territory. The Valley of Jezreel, Emek Israel, And fertile and gorgeous and at the heart of the Northern Kingdom. Okay. So we now have the map and we have a good sense of the geography. Now, in that Valley of Jezreel in the Northern Kingdom, a man named Navot, Na Naboth, if you use King James, we'll use Hebrew, Navot. Navot, the Israeli, he was from the Valley of Jezreel. Do you remember who else is from the Valley of Jezreel? We've just been learning about it Tuesday night. If you recall from Tuesday night, the last few weeks, it was up in Carmel that you had Avigail, who became the uh, wife of David, and Achinom of, of the Israelite, Israeli. So it was in this area of Jezreel that David picked up those two wives, Avigail and Achinom, um, when he was up north and during his tra travels and fleeing from the king. Okay. So Navo owned this extraordinary vineyard in Israel. And it's very close to the palace of King Ahav of Samaria. So let's see if we can kind of get that picture. We don't have to, so we won't spend a lot of effort trying to find it. But just to give you a little sense, you have Samaria is over here. That's where Samaria and here's Megiddo, and here's that valley, there's the promontory. So here's the valley, and here's Samaria. And so it's not next door, it's not like what we call here in LA, people who live in Pico Robertson but want to sound like they're richer than they are, talk about that they live in Beverly Hills adjacent. So it's not exactly Samaria adjacent, but it's close enough that the king would see it and would King would go there. It's like uh, if you live wherever you live, you probably have some very well-known vacation spots where you live. If you live in Los Angeles, so maybe sometimes you go to, uh, I don't know, uh, to uh, there are some people that like to go up to one or, uh, one or other of the uh, like Lake Arrowhead. It's not next door, but there are people that go there. There are other people who, let's say, go to visit obviously Disneyland, and but I mean like a, a lovely place that people might go. They might go to, I don't know, uh, Oxnard or uh, Santa Barbara. And the same way, if you live in uh, other parts of the United States, I don't know all the geography as, as well in each case, but in New Jersey, New York, some people would go up to the Pacific Palisades or wherever. So Emek Israel is a place a king might go just to a uh, vacation 
a lovely place. Vayadabera Ahav el Navot Limor, King Ahab said to this guy, he went to him. He said, I'd really love to have your vineyard. It's such a gorgeous vineyard. I'd love to make some, I'd love to get your vineyard. Give me your vineyard so that I may have it as a vegetable garden, since it is next to my palace. I'm not doing a, I'm not doing a unilateral taking. I'm willing to give you just compensation. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange. Or if you prefer, prefer, I'll pay you the price of money. So if the king has a better vineyard, why doesn't he take it for himself? Because he wants the vineyard that's near his palace. Tinoli at Karmacha Vihili Laganyarak. Kihu Karov Etzelbt. It's near my bayit, my house. It's Karov. And I'll give you etna latain no ten. I'll give you in its stead kerem tov mimenu, an even better kerem. Im tov beinecha, assuming that makes you happy. I want to make you happy. And if you prefer etna lecha kesef mechirsa, I'll give you money for that for its price. Sounds reasonable. Vayomer Navot el Achav, Navot says to King Ahab, I can't do it. I can't do it. Chalila li Hashem, God forbid. Mititi et nachalat avotai lach. Here's the problem. The problem is, it's not just mine. But when Joshua came into the land of Israel and he apportioned by God's order and directive, the newly liberated land of Israel, taken from the Canaanites, and apportioned to each tribe its tribal portion. And then within each tribe, families and households within tribes were given portions from within the tribal portion. And then fathers handed it down to their sons, and then they handed it down. This has been handed down to me. It's a family plot. It's a family portion. If it simply had been an investment, we could talk about it. I could take another point. But this is, we've had this from the time of Joshua. I can't do it. I hope you'll accept my, I can't do it. So King Ahab went home. Now, we just learned that a king is allowed to take just, to seize land as long as he pays for it. It doesn't say in Rambam that he has to negotiate. We just learned Rambam today. The king can just go and take as long as he pays. Rabbi? So I'll take the question. questions in a moment. I want to build some momentum okay. first. So okay. the king is taking this position uh, that I'm willing to pay. Navo is saying no. The king goes home. Sar Vizaef al Hadavar Shadibari Lav Navoda Israeli. He's deeply upset. That word Zaef, I don't want to take out the time now, but I could show you that verb is extremely unusual in Hebrew. But Joseph in the first book of the Torah, in Breshi Genesis, when Joseph is in the prison, Yosef is put in prison before he gets called up to go to the Paro and interpret the dream about the seven cows and the other seven cows, etc., etc. It says that one day Joseph, Yosef, is doing his rounds, and he encounters the steward, the wine steward, and the baker. And he sees that their faces are so afoot, that there's some kind of a, not just dispirited and sullen at the very least, they're just broken. There's something you could see on the face, a broken man. And that's what prompted Joseph, Yosef, to start asking, what's the problem? Then they told him about his, their dreams. And he prophesied that the butler is going to end up back in the Paro's uh, employ in three days as the wine steward. But for the baker, unfortunately, in three days, he's going to be getting hanged. Well, he comes home and he just has the look of death on his face. Al-Hadavar Shadibari Lav Navodi Israeli. 
And it's basically, he's just, he can't come to terms that he couldn't convince Navo to sell him the vineyard. Navo had said, I'm just not going to give you my family nachala, my inheritance. He was so upset by Ishkav Amitato. He just, the king of Israel. And I saved the time by not going through the previous chapter, chapter 20. He had just won some wars. So he was on top of his game right now. And yet he's so despondent that he just lies down in bed. He can't get out of bed. He's miserable. By our Savit Panavalo Achalechem. He just, he's not, he can't eat. He's absolutely, it's an interesting thing about people, how some people are satisfied with a piece of bread, and some people with millions and billions never have enough. And I don't criticize the rich who want to be richer. It's their life. Everyone's got his and her life. And what you do with your life is your decision. All I could do as a rabbi is try to share with you what I have learned from my rabbis should be the priorities in a lifetime. And there's nothing wrong with being rich. Avraham Avinu was rich. Yitzchak was rich. Yaakov was rich. Nothing at all wrong with being rich. David Melech was rich. Shlomo was rich. Rich is good. Rich means you don't have to be a burden on other people. You don't have to ask other people for money. You don't have to take from the public bourse. Therefore, that money could go to other poor people. Rich means you could even give to other people. Rich means you're happy. Rich means you pay your bills on time. Rich means you employ the economy. So it's good to be rich. But you should always know the purpose of wealth is so that you have peace of mind to serve God. Unlike someone else who doesn't know what he's going to eat for Shabbos. You can have wine. You don't have to start worrying. I can't afford wine. I'm going to get grape juice. I can't afford challah. I'm going to buy two little things of matzah. Money, I can send my children to yeshiva. Money, I can support Israel. So an important part of understanding what life is about, it's not so much should you be rich. It's understanding what the bottom line purpose is. I'll get to you in just a moment, Janet, by the way, because I've just about laid the groundwork on one. And uh, so he's not happy. He doesn't want a vineyard. He doesn't just want a vineyard because he wants more grapes or more vegetables. This is kind of like a, 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 it's like the mindset when you're playing Parker's brother, Parker Brothers Monopoly. He's got houses and he wants to start building hotels. And he wants to start building on, it's, it's not enough to have park place. He's got to have boardwalk. For that matter, even if he's only got crummy Mediterranean, it's still a thing to have Baltic. So you can build a house on Baltic. And he just can't come to terms with it. This is a chance to expand his property, and the guy won't sell him. So he's pouting in bed. He can't eat. And he's married to the toughest wife that the Bible basically has in its literature, Queen Jezebel, Izebel. And now Izebel comes into the bedroom. What's the matter? What's the matter, my little husband? Why are you crying? What's the matter? Not happy today. You just won a war yesterday. What's the matter? Your children didn't wish you a happy birthday. People forgot to wish you happy Father's Day, happy King's Day. Why is my little boy chick in bed all day long crying? And then he explains, because this guy won't let me buy his vineyard. And look who he's talking to with, you know, you'll see. and as I said, I'll take Janet's question in a moment. And so what's the matter? Mazarucha chasara, ve'encha ochelechem. Why are you so dispirited? You won't eat. And he's trying to explain to her. And no, I have a real reason. I mean, I, I have a good reason to be upset. I mean, I went to Navo the Jezreelite. I, I, I offered him. I mean, Jez, I mean, what's in there? Jez, yeah. Jez, I offered him. I offered him cash. 
I offered him a nicer vineyard. He said, I won't give you my vineyard. I don't know what to do. Oh, poor boy. So, Vatomari love, he's Evelishto. So, Jezebel takes deep breath. She's thinking to herself, God knows what, about this wuss that she's got on her hands now. She's got to inspire him. Ah, uh, Ata, Ata, that's with, a, with an Aleph means you, Y O U, with an I means now. You, now, would you act like a king for God's sakes? Get up, have a meal, be itavli bech. You have a king here. Make yourself merry. I'll give you your vineyard. Ani aten lechad kerem navot Yisraeli. I will get the vineyard for you. Don't you worry, your pretty little head. What did she do? Vatichtov svarim b'shem achav, vatichtom b'chotamo. She wrote out letters. Safer is a book, but it wasn't book. It's it's letters. It's like a, like royal edicts. She wrote out on parchment some royal edicts in his name, and she affixed the royal seal. And she sent out these royal documents all over the region of Jezreel, where Navot and his, and his uh, vineyard were, to the rabbinic leaders. The, they weren't rabbis in those days. They weren't rabbinic leaders. They were they were religious spiritual leaders, the Canaan, the elders. And what did these what did these sheets, these uh decree, what did they say? On all of these different pages that she distributed and circulated to all the leaders of the Jezreel Valley, as though sealed bearing the royal seal as though having been written by the king Ahav, it said, I hereby as king command that everyone in the region declare a public day of psalm, of fasting. Fasting? Fasting because there has been a blasphemy, the holy name of God. It has been spoken in, in a way for which it's a capital punishment. We were just uh, in the Torah. There's a section in the Torah about the man who blasphemed and was executed. And then what she did was she set up two liars, two people who are Anshe Belial, not just scoundrels, godless, despicable people with no shame or fear, eager and happy to perjure themselves for a reward. If you remember, if you ever saw the movie, I heartily recommend, if you ever watch a movie and you haven't seen it, A Man for All Seasons, um, the one about Sir Thomas More, starred Paul Schofield, extraordinary movie, back in the days when they made extraordinary movies. And uh, the King of England decides he wants Sir Thomas More to bless his divorce and remarriage. And Sir Thomas More is a Catholic, and England is still Catholic, and Henry VIII is trying to create a new religion that's just like Catholicism, only it will allow divorce. And it's going to become known as Anglicism. And in its American version, it's known as Episcopalianism. That's what Episcopalians are. That's the Anglican Church. They didn't want to call themselves England because they were in revolt against England. So they maintained that church and they gave it a different name. Um, but basically, that church is Catholicism. Unlike the other Protestant denominations, it's mostly Catholicism, only they allowed divorce was created so that the king could get divorced a couple of times. Didn't have to keep executing his wives in order to marry someone else. So in that movie, they find a, a guy 
who in return for being promised a royal office was willing, his name was Richie Rich, of all things. Later, of course, taken and made into a cartoon by people who have no idea of, him, of, of, of British history. But his name was Richard Rich. And uh, he, he perjured himself. He swore on the Bible to a lie that Thomas More had said something he had not said. And by that virtue, Henry VIII had a trial and More was executed, beheaded. So likewise here, she gets two. In Judaism, it's not enough to have Richie Rich. In Judaism, under the Torah, you need two witnesses. Makes it a little bit harder. You need to find two perjurers. Two on Shebliyal. So she gets two on Shebliyal, and they testify perjury. Be'rachta elokim v'melech. To testify that he, that he blasphemed. It is so forbidden to speak ill of God. In Hebrew, we're not even allowed to put the word curse next to, in the same sentence, the word God. So if you want to say that somebody did that, in Hebrew, the way it's said is that he blessed God. And you understand from the context of, of the sentence that it means the opposite. But you're not even allowed, just like some people write G-D instead of G-O-D because they don't want even the English word. That's only a translation of a pronoun. It's not actually God's holy name. Even the word God is only a pronoun instead of the name of God. And it's only English. It's not Hebrew. And yet there are many of us who write G-D because the word shouldn't be thrown in the garbage. So in the same way, the holiness of God's name uh, when one wants to refer to someone as having committed the opposite act, they'll say Beirach Elohim. That technically, literally, would translate as he blessed God, but it means the opposite. So she goes and puts out this document, calls for a fast, because if anyone hears God's name taken that way, a person has to fast an entire day for that reason, for that. That's like Tisha B'Av, Yom Kippur quality. It's that holy God's name. Hard to imagine in the year 2024 Western society, but we Orthodox Jews, the name of God is that holy. There's a uh, Christian denomination calls themselves the, uh, we, we refer to them as the J witnesses. Even though the first word that they have starting with the letter J is their King James transliteration of God's Hebrew name. And it's not actually the Hebrew name because there's no letter J in Hebrew. You know that. So even though in English, it isn't even the Hebrew name transliterated properly, we still refer to them as the J witnesses. You'll never hear an Orthodox Jew say that he got a doorbell ring on a Sunday and it was one of the blankety blank, one of those witnesses. Because we're not allowed to say, not allowed to say, you have to treat God's name that holy. Okay. So we're going to have two people say that they heard Navot blaspheme, and he also cursed the king, which itself would be something that the king is allowed. We've been learning Rambam the last few weeks. The king is allowed to have somebody executed just for making fun of him, much less cursing him. And therefore, the king orders, So take him out, stone him, and execute him. So the sages of the region, they obeyed what Jezebel had sent to all of them in the name of the king. They declared a day of fasting. They grabbed Navot, they arrested him, and they put him on trial in front of the entire nation. And then these two falsifiers and perjurers stood in front of the entire nation, testified falsely under oath that he had blasphemed. They said that he had done so regarding God and regarding the king, and everyone took him out, and they stoned him, and they killed him. And by Shlucho Eli Zebel, he more so called Navot 
and the word was sent back to Queen Jezebel. The deed is done. He has been executed. And now, as you just learned today from Rambam, if someone, let's say, curses the king, the king has authority on that grounds alone to have him executed. And if the king has somebody executed, all that person's property that sheets directly to the king, not to the government, certainly not to the public, but to the king's personal property. Haruge Hamelech. Anybody whom the king declares capital punishment worthy. And when Jezebel heard that Navot had been stoned and is dead, she went to her husband, King Ahab, and told him, Come, raise your term, Navoti Israelim. Go ahead. It's yours. Take, seize, seize the vineyard of Navot, the Jezreelite. Asher may ain la tetlecha bekesef, who refused to give you his vineyard in exchange for money, ki ain navot chai ki met, because now he's dead. He's no more problem. But he kishmo achav ki met navot, when the king heard that navot is dead, ve'akam achav l'redet, al kerem navot Yisraeli l'rishto, the king went to take control of that vineyard start talking about this particular episode, and they say there are a lot of interesting things cooking here but beneath the surface. For example, the way we learn the Mishnah Torah in the actual text is that the king has the right to take it for his men to feed them while they're fighting at war, to feed them the olives, the grapes from the fields. So Rambam, that we learned tonight, the king has the right to seize vineyards and olive fields and all of that to feed his men. There's one opinion that if you read it carefully, the king does not have the right to take those lands just to aggrandize and expand his own ownings and property because he's got an ego and because he just wants to have a bigger field and all the things you just said. So that's that's a sin. On top of Aside from the five of the Ten Commandments we just talked about, that's a sin that he actually does not have the right to take it just for his own whim and, and uh, aggrandizement. There's a second factor, that there's a possibility, at least according to one of the commentators on Rambam, that an exception to the general rule that gives the king the right to take car, uh, vineyards and olive fields and all, an exception is if he wants to take property that is a familial inheritance that they learned from the story of Navot, which we're not done with. We still have part two, but I wanted to pause for your question and comments. But we're going to see everything the king did here was sinful, unjustified, and will pay a terrible price for it. But the rabbis, therefore, are trying to figure out wherein lay the sin. Because the sin is not, it's kind of intuitive, but doesn't he have the right to have some extraordinary power? And so they try to find where were the deviations from the power he was given? And that's what we're finding. Uh, maybe it's that he was only allowed to take it for his men at wartime and not for his own aggrandizement. And maybe it's that he's still never allowed to take land that's part of a inheritance from someone's generations before, that that could be an exception. And then there are some other exceptions. So, and then of course, all the obvious ones where it's a setup and you're taking a good man and you're accusing him of blasphemy and you're putting other people up to, to, to commit perjury and you're great creating, you're getting all the elders who are supposed to be the religious leaders end up becoming part and parcel without even realizing that they're part of your scam. And then you're bringing this evil to the whole nation and you're the king. So you're supposed to be the most important role model, not the worst role model. And what are you thereby kind of establishing as far as the fear and respect people are supposed to have of kings and future kings. There's so much going on here. And that's what brings us to Vayihid of Hashem, El Eliyahu. Boy, did he have the good luck or bad luck that the prophet in his generation was Elijah, Eliyahu. So God in every generation, you know, we learned only last Thursday and uh, also in Tuesday, uh, Navi class, we were learning how God always puts in place someone whom God is going to need as something unfolds later. 
and we were talking about how even before King Saul died in battle, God already had put David in place so he'd be ready and prepared when Saul would die in battle to rise promptly to be the new king. And then we had that Gemara that gave a whole bunch of other examples. Moshe died, Yehoshua already was in place, Joshua. And then there were certain rabbis in the Talmud who died, and their successors already were in place. And in the same way, God seems throughout the books of Shmuel and and Malachim, the books of Samuel and books of Kings, always to have a prophet in place as a counterfoil and a counterweight to the king. And it's always a prophet or a navi who's kind of got the same kind of weight and strength. So for the first king of Israel, you would need a, a navi the quality of a Samuel, a Shmuel. Perhaps a somewhat less famous Navi might be exactly what was needed with a somewhat less, let's say, weighty king. And now with Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab and Jezebel, for that generation, God put in place a prophet Eliyahu, the Eliyahu Hanavi that we all sing about, Elijah the prophet, precursor to Mashiach. That's what it took to stand up. And there are about three or four things where Eliyahu and King Ahab have, have, have confrontations where Eliyahu gets sent by God. And when you want to talk about sometimes in, in the silly politics of the modern world and someone says something that is or is not meaningful and then wants to get praised for talking truth to power, Eliyahu talked truth to power. Eliyahu was there called by God to speak to the king and to bring God's word. And don't be afraid. He won't touch you. He may want to, but he won't dare. And so here, Eliyahu HaTishbi, you know, Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu HaTishbi. Where does, that, where does that Tishbi come from? So this is it. This is where he's called HaTishbi. Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hagil Adi, because he was based around Mount, uh, around the Gilad area. Kum, God says, Reid Lekrad Achav Melch Yisrael Asher B'Shomron. I want you now to go to King Ahab, who's in Samaria, the capital city of Shomron. Hine Becherem Navot Asher Yerad Sham L'Rishto. You will find him right now, not in his palace, but nearby in the vineyard of Navot. He has just gone there, descended there to inherit it, to seize possession of it. And the verb, it's interesting, Yarad Sham. He has descended there morally, ethically. He has, it's not so much that he went down, though it is in a valley, but he also morally has descended to take it. The Dibarte lovely more. And you are to speak to him as follows. Ko Amar Hashem. So it's clear you're speaking in my name. And that's often when God talks to a Navi, he doesn't just say, and tell them as follows, but he says, when he says, tell them as follows, he starts with, tell them as follows, thus saith God. So there's no question that it is not you, Elijah, expressing your own personal uh, moral outrage. But you are here by the command of God. Have you dared murder? And as you know, Horeg is to kill, Rotseach is to murder. Not ha haragta, but ha ratsachta. Not have you killed, but have you murdered? And further had the the chutzpah, the brazenness and audacity, then to take that man's property. And you should further, so that's quote unquote, and then you further should say, and furthermore, God says, you have executed Navot, you have stoned him, and dogs have come and licked his blood, right? Stone against the human body is going to cause bleeding in the skull area. And the natural way of things is that 
dogs are going to come and lick the blood in the place where dogs have licked the blood of Navot, Yaloku Hakalavim et Domcha Gamata. You'll pay for this, says God. This is not some prophetic prophecy that's that's poetic. It's not a poetic prophet, prophetic. This is literally Mida Kineged Mida, measure for measure. God is going to set, God is going to arrange at some point. He's telling King Ahab, you will die a violent death, and dogs will lick your blood. Now, as I said, we're suddenly coming in for tonight's class in the context of our general subject of Thursday nights, so it's not part of the more smooth first kings as though we've been going through the last 20 chapters, and now we're up to chapter 21. That will come maybe a year from now when we finish Second Samuel, small bet, then we go into Malachim Al, First Kings. But if you had been learning, if we had been learning the last 20 chapters, they already have had several encounters where King Ahab and Ezebel are evil people. They're just plain bad people, evil. And Eliyahu is sent by God on several occasions to deal with them. And so by now, Eliyahu is kind of like public enemy number one. And the king is long since tired of seeing him. And so that's what the king, uh, so you have found me, my enemy. No sooner, you didn't even give me like an hour to enjoy my new vineyard. Already you're starting up with me? Hamid Satani IV. Bayomer Hamid Sati. You bet I found you. Ahab said to Eliyahu, so you found me, my enemy? Yes, I have found you, he replied. You bet, Matsati. Because you brought shame to yourself to do this extraordinary evil for the eyes of God. Therefore, God has commanded me to tell you that he is going to bring such an evil on you for this. When do you see the word biur? Bet ayin resh. A beur bet aleph resh is an explanation or a translation. Biur, that's like beur chametz. That's when you utterly eradicate the chametz. Levair with an ayin is a complete eradication. And God is saying through Eliyahu, not only that is this king going to die a violent death with dogs licking his blood, but God is going to eradicate him. He's going to put an end to his line. This is incredibly strong stuff. The word sheten in Hebrew means urine, to urinate. Here is a wall. At the height of anger, it's a term that's seen sometimes in Malach Amal of 1 Kings. And it's a shocking term when we consider the holy language of the Bible. If sheten is urination, mashtin bakir is the one who urinates on a wall. It is a very gross, crude way of referring to a male, M-A-L-E. A female cannot urinate on a wall. Maybe in the movies, especially today, nowadays. But that's not a way. But a man, if you've ever been to Dodger Stadium, uh, that was the first time I was ever in a public men's room. I mean, a really public men's room. Dodger Stadium is like one whole gigantic wall of uh, porcelain. And it's sort of like you begin to realize the uh, the original source of Los Angeles River. And uh, basically somewhere by the third inning, after three innings of uh, 2,000 men drinking beer, um, suddenly the room, suddenly the LA River goes up four inches, even during the dry season. And uh, Amashtin Bakir is the biblical term for male. It's an angry, uh, and because again, the way we talk in the, the way Bible talks, there's never like really dirty words. There are like one or two unusually graphic words in Hebrew that are not even dirty, but they're graphic 
although clean, in American language, no one would hesitate to the word hemorrhoid. Is hemorrhoid a dirty word? Halavai, that should be the dirtiest word spoken in the English language. But in the Torah, when the word hemorrhoid appears in the Torah, on the Torah reading in Shul, we don't read that word. We're supposed to pronounce a different word. There's an alternative word to hemorrhoid. You're not supposed to read the word hemorrhoid out loud with the Torah open. But it's not nice. It's not a filthy word, but you're talking about hemorrhoids. You know where they are. It's not nice. There is the tochacha, where God warns the Jewish people, God forbid, if you turn away from my laws and you turn away and you start following, God forbid, other gods, I will bring this on you and that on you. It appears at the end of the book of Leviticus, Vayikra. It appears again in another version in Kitavo at the end of, towards the end of Deuteronomy, Devarim. And in both those places, it talks about, and if you keep sinning, people will be smitten with this and with that and with hemorrhoids. And that word is not read. And if you keep sinning, it talks about that your wives will be taken and they will be violated. And uh, the Hebrew word, the strongest, a word that's even a little stronger than rape. There's a slightly stronger word than rape in the Hebrew language. And it appears in those two spots, and it's never read out loud. It, is, uh, it appears in the Torah parchment itself. But the Torah reader needs to know as part of being a Torah reader, you never recite that word. You recite the alternative word. That's how Judaism is. In Israel today, all the curses, all the curses in Hebrew are Arabic words. They have curses. We don't have curses. That's why it's called Lashon HaKodesh. Lashon HaKodesh, the holy language. It's too, it has nothing, it doesn't have dirty words. The dirtiest word in Hebrew, I, we were just watching Fauda the other night. So they were referring to the number one Hamas terrorist in season one who blew up a guy. I don't think I gave anything up. A guy from Hamas blew someone up. Spoiler alert, I should have said. So that guy, at one point, is referred to as a benzona. That's the strongest curse in all of Hebrew. The son of a prostitute. You son of a prostitute. It gets no, anything stronger than that, you need Arabic. And maybe that's why God put the Arabs all over, so we would have a richer language to use when people get angry at uh, whoever's the government. So here what's happening is, that's what that term means as we start winding down now. God is going to wipe out all males, whoever would descend from Ahav. He will have no further sons, which means his dynasty is going to end. A male dynasty is certainly going to end. I will bring disaster upon you, more than disaster. I will make a clean sweep of you. I will cut off from Israel every male belonging to Ahav. And it's probably going to tell you what it literally is. No, you don't tell you. I told you. Uh, the Hebrew word for male would be Zahar. But here it's uh, what I just explained. I mentioned that Ahab is one of the three or so worst things, most evil ever. And I said, he's right up there with Yeravam, Jeroboam, the first king of the Civil War division. So that's the other one. He, Yeravam, is always the uh, yardstick, the standard by which an evil king is judged. Is he as evil as Yeravam was? I will make your house like the house of Yeravam, and like the house of Baasha. In both cases, your house will be wiped out. And as far as your wife Jezebel goes, in the same exact way, not only will dogs lick her blood, dogs will eat her. Dogs will consume Ezebel in the valley of Jezreel, in the field of Jezreel. She will be killed like, like pit bulls on the loose. I was just reading this week some fellow who was raising five pit bulls and just got killed. They went wild in the, just this past week. 
when we were talking earlier tonight about things a Jew should aim to do in a lifetime and things to live for, raising pit bulls, I think, I think someone needs to make a really good, strong argument to be persuasive on that one. All of Ahav's line who die in the town shall be devoured by dogs, and all who die in the open country shall be devoured by the birds of the sky. Anyone from your line who dies either will be consumed by dogs, they won't be buried, or if they die in a desert where no dog is to be found, vultures will get them. And indeed, there never was anyone like Ahav who committed himself to doing what was displeasing to God at the instigation of his wife, Izebel. He acted most abominably and he did the most awful of things like the Emorites. And as a result, we wrap it up. Now he first had what to cry about, what to lie down in bed and not eat about. When he heard that, what has to be said in his favor, in his, if not defense, to his credit, instead of responding by insulting Eliyahu, or by trying to punish Eliyahu, he realized that what the prophet of God had just told him, he realized he had heard the truth. And he realized there was a moment of mourning, and he tore his own garments. By a Krabagadavaya Samsaka Bisarobiatsum, he tore his garments in mourning for himself and his future generations that would not be. And he clothed himself in sackcloth which in biblical times was the ultimate way of assuming a period of mourning and grief by Atzom, and he fasted. And he actually did not go to bed, but he lay and slept in sackcloth, and he walked subdued. And the word of God came to Eliyahu as we finished the chapter. Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his lifetime. It will happen. But I will give him respite that he will not have to watch all of his family wiped out with the dogs and the vultures consuming them. By showing that much contrition and some grief and humility, I will bring the disaster upon his house in his son's time. And so as we wrap it up now, what we come away with as we close tonight is that the king has extraordinary power, and yet there's a check on the king's power. For a few classes now, I've been talking to you about this extraordinarily unbridled monarch, monarchical power where the king can do whatever he wants, take whatever he wants, conscript anybody he wants, go to war anytime he wants, defy the courts, defy the judges. But God sends a counterweight, whether it's the prophet of the generation in biblical times or an equivalent religious force in any particular era who stands up to the king and carries the word of God to the king and is a counterbalance. We're now done with that. We're up to chapter 5, Perak Hay, of Hilchot Malachim, the king going to war. You now have the complete picture, at least as much as I could give, with some introductory contextual courses or classes. Any other questions?